It is an honor to be called upon to deliver the keynote address for this conference. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity and I thank you all for your time. I'm turning now to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. And we begin to read from verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, With our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side, when the vilest men are exalted. And now let us pray together. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to thee now and ask for thy blessing upon us, and upon this conference and we pray that Lord even now that will open the, our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior and for his sake Amen now my dear friends as the keynote uh, speaker for the conference I just want to proceed basically to speak about three things. The precept of sanctification, which is the theme for this conference, the problem of sanctification, and the prayer for sanctification. And that prayer is what we find in Psalm 12, especially verse 1. And so I would like to proceed without necessarily looking at the prayer now and just go straight to the precept for of sanctification and just attempt a brief definition because uh, I don't want to take out the wind out of the sails of other speakers I just want to attempt such a brief um, definition of the precept of sanctification the word sanctification signifies to consecrate and set apart to a holy use thus they are sanctified people who are separated from the world and set apart for God's service. Sanctified persons are people, of course sinners, who are called out of the world by the proclamation of the gospel, having been shown grace and mercy and kindness of Christ to repent of their sins and to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, enabled to believe on him for salvation by the Holy Spirit, justified by faith alone in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and enabled by the Spirit to live a sanctified life as a witness to the world and for the glory and purpose of Christ. Now this might sound a little bit too long a definition, but of course uh, I just want to read you the definition, uh, brief definition that Thomas Watson uh, gave. He says, sanctification is a principle of grace, savingly wrought, whereby the heart becomes holy and is made after God's own heart. A sanctified person bears not only God's name, but his image. Quote Thomas Watson. Therefore, we know, my dear friends, that sanctification is evidently a principal end of all the purposes, the promises, and the operations of our glorious Lord. Now, note number one, we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world that we might be holy, according to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. 
and then secondly we were redeemed by Jesus to be a peculiar people unto himself zealous of good works according to Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 and thirdly we are called with a holy calling according to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 and fourthly we are to be presented to God at the last day as quote holy unblameable unreprovable in his sight when we read Colossians chapter 1 verse 22 Jude 24 and 25 and so by these Christians or believers are described in a number of ways as far as sanctification is concerned in the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 believers are described as holy brethren holy brethren and then in first Peter chapter 2 verse 5 and verse 9 believers or Christians are described as a holy priesthood a holy priesthood then we read Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 and uh, believers are described as holy and beloved and of course in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 and chapter 6 verse 19 believers are described as a holy temple the temple that the Holy Spirit dwelleth know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit the temple of God so my dear friends when we are talking about this we are simply trying to say that as far as sanctification is concerned no believer is exempt every believer is sanctified in Christ because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that is why in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 we read that this is the will of God even our sanctification even our sanctification and until our sanctification is complete and we exactly resemble the Lord Jesus Christ in body soul and spirit our salvation will not be full it will not be finished nor God's glorious purpose accomplished we must be like him for we are predestined to it for we read in first John 3 2 especially that we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and so when we pick up another passage in second Corinthians 3 verse 18 we read and we all would unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Spirit of the Lord 2nd Corinthians 3 and verse 18 therefore my dear friends when we behold the image of the invisible God as it is presented in the person and character of Christ we too are made like it not indeed by a mere natural effect but put by the Spirit of the Lord therefore please note this likeness to God alone is holiness and growth in this likeness is growth in grace and it is all by the Lord Jesus Christ so that is just in a way trying to uh, briefly explain the precept of uh, sanctification and it is meant for us to know and understand as I said a little bit earlier that every one of us is described in these terms and therefore sanctification is without exception it must be one that must uh, be aspired to desired by every believer to be holy and remember as we read in first peter chapter 1 
uh, Peter's epistle, First Peter, I read you, I'm sure we know that, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So no Christian is exempt. And none should say, well, sanctification is not for me. It's for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and has become a believer in the Lord. But I come to my second hurting, which is a problem. And sadly in our day, we see a problem with the understanding of sanctification with the desire for sanctification and with the practice of sanctification well let me try and explain as we go on number one sanctification is not preached a cursory scrutiny of most modern sermons from popular pulpits we see that a subject is not preached at all not taught at all in fact what are the evidences we may say when it comes to these things well number one because we know that by and large the gospel is not preached and because the gospel is not preached one cannot truly and faithfully preach the gospel without preaching sin and how sin is forgiven and why sin must not be indulged in very important now there are many who say they preach the gospel today but of course they are not in any way serious about it they just say a few things about preaching and then it is you know they think that's 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 preaching that's that's gospel now we ought to be very careful there must be a clear-cut evangelistic appeal and all the terms all the demands all of god's offer all of the promises and all of the things that serve as a prop or a background for every man to understand the will of salvation must be clearly explained you cannot preach the gospel without talking about the law for instance because the law reveals sin the law is the one that tells us we are sinners and so it is for us to seek forgiveness for sins in the lord jesus christ and so so long as churches have neglected the preaching of the gospel certainly sanctification will never come in at all I mean if it is just like trying to ask someone who cannot swim to swim the person cannot swim how can he swim you put him in the water he will drown he will not understand he doesn't know how to swim and so my dear friends that might be perhaps a poor illustration but of course just to make the point that I want to uh, say that by and large the messages that we hear these days are not messages that speak about salvation they speak about justification they speak about sanctification they speak about adoption it's just anything anyone taking up the bible saying anything so sanctification is not touched on at all in the is the point that i'm making the second thing you will notice why sanctification is not even preached because you see that in most churches even church attendance is a drudgery for many it is minimal people don't see the reason why they must be in church in my second address when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ I'll make that example very clear many people don't see to see that public worship is necessary in any way they can get up very early and uh, because of everything beats the traffic to go to work or to go about their business but when it is the lord's day morning they take some time there's no urgency 
and some could for very flimsy excuse excuse themselves away from uh, church and you see because some people don't see that public worship is in itself a means of sanctification and so my dear friends we see the evidence there then thirdly you notice that preachers these days are more concerned about speaking to they say the needs of members rather than that which they need most which is salvation and sanctification people speak about the physical needs health wealth they talk about how to be rich and all of that and all of those things that come from the charismatic world and because of that that which people need we can't take riches to heaven we are told that very clear in first timothy chapter 6 we cannot take these things or these matters or anything in the world to the other world to the lord the lord to heaven we cannot and yet we struggle we strive and the message from the charismatic world is look for the burst enjoy whilst you're on earth jesus has a nice wonderful plan for you he loves you therefore enjoy yourself here on earth and do all the things that you want to do whilst you're on earth they don't speak about salvation neither do they speak about sanctification at all so you see the problem we have in our world is that sanctification number one is not even preached now secondly sanctification is not light in in our world today not in any way at all and uh, I can tell you many reasons but let me share you a personal um, account uh, of myself and usually uh, my church members have uh, heard this story over and over again but uh, I would like to say it again perhaps if I crave their indulgence who are watching you know before I got saved my mind was Christianity has too much of restrictions in those days in the late 70s and the early 80s when I was attending the fundamental Baptist Church then and being taught by well-grilled uh, American missionary fundamental Baptists who, uh, who preach the gospel in a manner some of us call they preach it with heat and urgency as if the world is coming to an end today and when we are urged to seek Christ to have our sins forgiven and to live a holy life I thought that was too restrictive it was going to take away my freedom I cannot enjoy myself the way I want to but when I got saved later little did I know that I was in bondage to sin little did I know that I had shackles all over me and have scales over my eyes my dear friends many consider self um, sanctification as a subject that is for instance dull and interesting why talk about sanctification when you could talk about perhaps what will please the youth today marriage and relationships or what will please married people about why why talk about sanctification they see it as dull and interesting they don't like it others also consider it too restrictive as i said a killjoy and uh, as put by one old puritan he said they delight in sin and make sin their delight that's the idea here any encouragement to put the brakes and restraining hand on our lusts and darling sins is immediately rejected and so my dear friends so many people don't like sanctification in any in any way now still others find some vain theological reasons for their dislike of sanctification the things sanctification consists of rules of do's and don'ts and they call it legalism 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 and they say well christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law and we are not under the law but we are under grace and so they think that 
when we ought to say look let's be careful about our lifestyle let's be careful what we think let's be careful what we do let's be sure that we honor the command from scripture that we must be holy in all manner of conversation or conduct or lifestyle they think that is too legal that is too restrictive that is the law we must have freedom to do all that we can and so you see they try to look for some theological reason to try to discount the issue and the matter of sanctification and we may also add that there are others who believe that times have changed and therefore we need to move on therefore they say oh you say things like sanctification should be you know consigned into the dustbin of history and go for modern approach to issues and not to try to live a holy life and so you see many people claim therefore that we must not necessarily seek to be holy or strive to be holy and be sanctified in our conduct in the things we say and the things we do and so you see my dear friends i want to quote again william plumer one of the puritans william plumer and um, he writes and i quote he says if we are called to be saints we are not called to serve any but the lord jesus christ holiness may be out of fashion here on earth but not in heaven it is infinitely better to be uh, a peculiar people zealous of good works than a people laden with iniquity truth never generates licentiousness actual participation in Christ's righteousness is always manifested by the possession of his temper and image end of quote by William Plumer the third thing I want to note about the problem of sanctification in our day is that it is not practiced. It is not just preached, nor liked, but of course if it is not preached and liked, then the third problem is that it is not practiced. And we have so many evidence all around us to try to point to. You will notice, number one, that instead of sanctification, we have the encouragement for all manner of worldliness in church and individual life we are rather encouraged you go to a school or you go to do anything and the very first thing you want to do with children is to bring in worldly music or something that will immediately make the children as they say happy and so people don't seem to really care you find adults in our part of the world who will organize birthday parties who will organize many other things and for them it's okay they don't need to exercise any kind of uh, holiness and righteousness even in their celebrations and so we are encouraged to be worldly in all manner of ways not secondly also sanctification is not practiced because Christians are more concerned with getting as much as possible the wealth and the pleasures of this world get it as much as you can that's what the preachers say so you could be happy so you can understand so you see if we speak about sanctification well it does not show itself in any individual's life nor even the church life young believers are no longer concerned about even serving the Lord Jesus Christ often I speak to my Sunday school teachers that the teaching ministry of the church is unique in itself because it is not just what you say or teach but actually how you live you could be a lecturer in a secular situation in a secular world and all you can do is just go and deliver your lecture and you're okay you are home and dry whatever you do outside if you go to the bar to have a drink <laughs> that's not anybody's concern you've gone to do your teaching your students are supposed to do your assignments that's okay but that is not so with Christian ministry Christian ministry involves not just what you say but it's also what you do 
You ought to be an example. And you see, the reason why many young people run away even from serving the Lord is because of the strictness of it. And so in our world, we find out that sanctification is not practiced. And the evidence is, I don't want to be involved in ministry. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be part. And so it goes on. We see also that Sunday schools are, or Sunday school ministries are by and large neglected. And where there is some work, little spiritual attention is paid. In other words, it's like just get the children to do anything. Just so that, oh, we come to gather them and they can do anything. But spiritual attention. What are we teaching them? What exactly should they know? How can they understand that we pay no attention? Church leaders will not pay any attention to it. It's just get children to come, maybe sing some songs and dance around and have some choreography and some of that, and that's okay. The children are happy. So you see, my dear friends, we have so much of these evidence. Many church leaders also, you know, shy away from church discipline afraid of losing members and so in the local church people who sin are not disciplined and there's open scandalous sinning in our local churches and no one seems to talk about it and one of the difficulties even where there is some attempt to discipline is that you have groups in the church who are friends with the one who is living in sin and so they will not even mention it because they don't want to be seen as betraying their own friends. You see the point? And so they go on becoming participants and partakers of other members' sins. You know also, churches now, I can say with authority, exist only as social clubs and entertainment places where everybody does whatever they like. You go to church, someone say, I am um, a dancer, so I come to exhibit my dancing skills. Someone says, uh, I am a, a vocalist, so I must come and hold the microphone and, and uh, roll over my voice and let it waft in the air. And that's the thing. I must exercise my gifts in the church and all. I remember telling a charismatic friend, says, so do you go to church? Assuming you go to church and you play football. I used to play football with him. You play football. I say, ah, okay, I'm also a footballer. So I come to church. Let me bring the ball and then, you know, play and do some skills. Is that what you do? Because that's your gift. It's a total misunderstanding of even the gift of the Spirit. But the church has become almost like a social club. Enjoy yourself and do all that you can. Note also, another reason that I want to point out, church prayer meetings are hardly attended. You don't find many people coming. Why don't they come to be church prayer meetings? They are busy. They cannot make it. They have other things to attend to. They cannot come and pray that souls will be saved. They have no heart for souls. It reminds us of what the Lord Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel 24 and verse 12. And because iniquity shall what? Prevail. The love of many shall wax cold. Mission work and church planting ventures receive no support at all. So my dear friends, all these things are as a result of not practicing sanctification. They come in and we may have so many reasons to say and we could go on and list so many things. But I come now to my third heading here, the prayer. Because, you see, my dear friends, the question is this. In the midst of such great decline in apostasy, what must we do? What can we, well, how can we bring back sanctification to the fore and the front burner? This is why my psalm comes in with those opening words there. Help, Lord, for the godly man seizeth, for the faithful feel from among the children of men. Oh, this psalm highlights the problem of the day. Godly men season. What does that mean? The godly man in this text actually denotes a person who is so spirit-filled that he's merciful. He's a person who can be regarded as righteous, a pious man whose main characteristic is to show compassion to people. A, a godly man, my dear friends, is a saved man 
and a sanctified man his heart is pure and the phrase there help lord for the godly man ceaseth this means you don't have many godly people anymore they are not there they cannot be seen only a few people no wonder jesus asked nevertheless when the son of man shall come shall he find faith on the earth it appears as we near the end of the world as we live in these perilous times we have only a few good men help lord for the godly man ceaseth for the faithful fail from among the children of men the faithful man fail well who are the faithful those who profess faith in the lord and have become unfaithful and have been dispersed or almost disappearing you see my dear friends that's what it is i was reading a book a couple of years ago the writer was a jewish woman and a husband living in america and she made a point in that little booklet that she went into a, a shop and a store and she found out that she could not find one single dress that is modest all the dresses are so cut so seductive and she couldn't bear to buy one from the store and so she was saying that it appears as if she had to go to ask for a special kind of uh, uh, seamstress or tailor to make a, a dress for her and so my dear friends the idea is this it appears as if good men now are hard to find it appears as if godly people are hard to find oh can i say this someone also said told me this many years ago that pastor i don't think there are virgins in the world ladies men and women who have kept themselves from fornication and from that promiscuous lifestyle in the world and i said well i don't know but there may be a few we have no statistics to find out we have no way to find out but as the law reserves some people for himself like in the days of elijah so the lord has a people for himself the day, people who may not have bowed to the culture of the world and so you know the text help lord for the godly man seetheth for the faithful fail from among the children of men oh my dear friends isn't this a prayer and those two opening words are really very important words help the word the word actually means save and lord as you find in the text actually is the name for jehovah which we know or yahweh help jehovah and that reminds us it takes us back to exodus chapter 3 when the name jehovah was revealed the i am that i am again to exodus chapter 6 when the name was made a bit more clearer jesus is the jehovah or jehovah as we know as some people may say and that's the point that we're talking about it is a cry and it is almost like an impromptu cry and so i'm begin going to end my address by just using those two words and applying help lord come to our aid oh well these two words i believe serve as our prayer for the hour and for this day help lord for thy sanctuary is defiled the sanctuary of the lord the church has been defiled by sin help lord help lord for thy name is despised thy glory is trampled upon the glory of the lord jesus christ and his name despised in the world help lord for thy church has been infiltrated by wolves in sheep's clothing they call themselves bishops and overseers and they've infiltrated the church but they are wolves in sheep's clothing help lord help lord help lord for the departure from the faith 
the apostasy of our day is so high help Lord for the unbelief pride and arrogance of sinful men defies thee in thy face every day help Lord for we have been tempted on every side and thy servants are weak help Lord for we are downcast and our faith is small oh my dear friends help help Lord and may I just read you this hymn by John Newton found in the Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship hymn number 80 and version 2 hymn number 80 version 2 I just read you the words for me the words of this hymn express the sentiment of our times I begin with stanza 1 Savior visit thy plantation Grant us, Lord, a gracious reign. All will come to desolation unless thou return again. Keep no longer at a distance. Shine upon us from on high, lest for want of thine assistance every plant should droop and die. Surely, once thy garden flourished, every part looked strong and green. Then thy word our spirits nourished. Happy seasons we have seen, but a drought has since succeeded, and a sad decline we see. Lord, thy help is sorely needed. Help can only come from thee. Where are those devoted leaders, filled with zeal and love and truth? Older pilgrims, tall as cedars, bright examples to our youth some in whom we once delighted are no longer here below others sadly now are blighted scarce a single leaf they show let our mutual hopes be fervent make us earnest in our prayers let each one who is thy servant shun the world's bewitching snares Break the tempter's fatal power, turn the stony heart to flesh, and begin from this good hour to revive thy work afresh. Oh, John Newton's words, friends, echo the sentiments. Help, Lord. It is a language of being attacked. We have been attacked. The church of Jesus Christ is being attacked. The scriptures have been attacked. The people of God have been attacked. Help, Lord. Lift up your eyes, friend. Lift up your voice to heaven. As we go through this com conference with all the addresses to come, help, Lord, you may pray. Help, Lord, so that we will be sanctified at the end of this conference, so we may please thee, so we may have zeal far beyond even our own strength so we may have understanding full so our love will not grow cold so our desires will be warm and hot so indeed our work will be pleasing in thy sight help lord for the godly man ceaseth for the faithful fail from among the children of men oh dear friends i pray that this may be your prayer and i pray that this conference will be a blessing and may God help us even now, for his own name's sake. Amen.